Hello, this is Amrit Anshirora with The Print. Uh, we are here at the 17th edition of the Jaipur Literature Festival. And with me is uh, former Foreign Secretary, Mr. Sham Saran. Thank you so much, sir, for speaking with us. Uh, sir, uh, I'd like to begin uh, this conversation with uh, your views on uh, uh, India-China, since uh, you were part of uh, the committee that uh, 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 was deliberating with the Chinese uh, on the boundary issue uh, during your years in the Foreign Service. Uh, I'd like your opinion on if you think uh, that a thaw in uh, India-China ties is likely in the near future, given that the uh, we, we're about to enter uh, third, uh, the third year of the standoff, uh, and it's 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 almost two, uh, three years since uh, the Galwan incident. Uh, do you think? Do you believe a thaw is likely in the near future? And if uh, yes, uh, how do you think that might uh, come across? So uh, one, uh, I don't think that the relations are yet in a freeze uh, because um, the communications between the two governments continues. Uh, our foreign ministers have been meeting. And uh, also with regard to the boundary issue itself, as you know, there have been several rounds of negotiations between the two sides, both uh, containing military personnel as well as diplomats. Uh, so a negotiating process is, is in place. Now, obviously we have insisted that unless we can go back to status quo ante, it is difficult to bring about a full normalization of relations or taking them back to where we were before Galwan happened. Uh, but this is uh, something which, uh, you know, uh, the process uh, is something that we are invested in. And uh, much will depend upon how, you know, the international situation, the geopolitical context uh, changes. I will never say as a diplomat that, you know, relations are riven in stone, uh, that they will not change. Uh, so many changes have taken place in the past and I do not think that uh, we should preclude the possibility that both countries will see it in their interest going forward with so many multiple crises that we are facing, so many multiple challenges which we are facing, that they will also see a certain merit in coming together again. Uh, so you've written extensively about... Uh how China is viewed in India and how India is viewed in China. Uh, you've also spoken in the past on multiple occasions about the need for uh, more and more uh, in young Indians to learn more about the Chinese economy, about Chinese history, Chinese culture. Uh, do you have any word of advice for uh, young Indians who want to study more about China on how they might... Repeat what I have uh, said, that even though India and China are neighbors, uh, they are in a real sense uh, strangers to each other, you know, uh, because uh, there has been very little engagement between the two countries, certainly in the last uh, few hundred years. And therefore, there is a very great need, particularly since China is going to be important for India, not only today, but going uh, forward in the future, it is imperative that uh, not only a few diplomats, not only a few scholars, but people in general uh, should know what China is all about. And in dealing with China, it is not enough to really focus, for example, on foreign policy, to focus only on security policy. You know, we need to understand the larger cultural context, the larger historical context within which China behaves in a certain way. You know, if you want to know why is China behaving in a certain way, Unless you have some familiarity with its very ancient culture, with its history, why does China think in the manner that it does? It is very difficult even to do a good job in terms of foreign policy or security policy. And I would say the same thing for China, that China has very little familiarity with India. What is India all about? How do Indian people think? How are they influenced by their own history, by their own culture? So there is a gap of understanding between the two countries, both at the governmental level, but more importantly, at the people's to people level. So I would certainly say that uh, for young people in India, you know, this can be a very exciting field for intellectual exploration. This is something which is very worthwhile to do. Also because I also believe that whatever be the state of relations between the two countries, this is a fascinating cult 
country. This is a fascinating civilization and culture. So it is very exciting to learn about what this culture is all about, what its history is. So yes, yeah, young people should do that. <laughs> uh, so I'd like to pivot now to uh, one of the two ongoing wars, uh, particularly the war in Ukraine. Uh, we've been uh, tracking how uh, the war has uh, more or less entered a phase of a stalemate, uh, as, as one might call it. In your opinion, is there an end game in sight to the war in Ukraine? And I have a follow up question on that in the context of Russia. Do you believe, uh, as someone who spent so many years uh, with the Foreign Service and uh, you've met with diplomats and uh, citizens from around the world, do you believe there is a real possibility of authentic democracy to flourish in Russia? You know, uh, uh, terms like democracy, autocracy, you know, these are very loaded terms. And, uh, you know, different uh, people may interpret them very differently. Uh, so I don't think we should get locked into that uh, debate. Are you a democracy or are you not a democracy? Uh, I think it is more important to see in terms of what we see today as a Russia Ukraine conflict, what are the ways in which what is a very, very destructive, debilitating conflict, how can that be brought to an end? Because it is not only Ukraine and Russia which are being impacted. As you can see that there is an impact across the world, you know, whether it's a food crisis or whether it is a fertilizer crisis, um, you know, this is, this is beginning to impact uh, other countries, including uh, India. Now, I certainly believe that in invading Ukraine, Russia made a very big miscalculation. Now, it is even possible that Russia may win many, many battles on the battlefield. But to my mind, Russia has in a sense lost the war. Why do I say that? Because number one, even if Russia leaves the whole of Ukraine as a kind of a ravaged country, you know, nothing standing at all. How does that count as victory? You know, you are going to be living next to a country which is utterly destroyed and whose people will probably be hostile to you for generations to come. Is that victory? You know, that's one question. Second question is that in terms of the strategic aims which Russia had put forward as an argument for invading Ukraine, one is you know, NATO was coming closer and closer to our borders. This was becoming a great security threat. No, you have ended up by doing exactly the opposite of what you wanted. NATO has actually come much closer to you. Sweden and Finland, which have a history of more than 200 years as neutral nations, they have decided to join NATO. So in terms of that strategic aim, actually you have, a, uh, you know, achieved exactly uh, the opposite. And thirdly, if the idea was how Russia should be able to at least have some degree of influence over what it calls its near neighborhood, whether it is Eastern Europe, whether it is Central Asia, you know, actually the country which is making the most inroads into these spaces is not the West, it is China. You know, how is this something which is actually promoting Russian interests? And so Russia is in danger of becoming a kind of a junior partner of China, which would, I think, for a country which looks at itself as a great power and is a great power, you know, this can be a very uncomfortable position to be in. And certainly from India's point of view, we would certainly like that Russia should be a great power, should have independent positions and that India Russia relations are not adversely impacted by what is happening today between Russia and China. Uh, so my next question for you is uh, in the context of the ongoing conflict uh, in Gaza. Uh, you have spoken at length uh, uh, more recently on your, uh, you've expressed your views on uh, the subject. Uh, I would like to speak to you about two particular aspects of the ongoing conflict which are more recent. The first being uh, there have been reports over the past week uh, that the US uh, uh, government, the Biden administration may be considering a proposal to recognize 
uh, the uh, is uh, Palestine as a sovereign state. Uh, hypothetically speaking, if such a thing were in the works, uh, in your opinion, would it uh, drive Israel away from the US or would it uh, impact the ties adversely? It, there is no doubt that uh, the one country which has any degree of influence over Israel, it is the United States of America. Israel's ability to continue this war uh, in Gaza uh, is dependent upon you know, American support. Uh, therefore, what stance the United States adopts is going to be very critical in terms of what end game we see with respect to this conflict. Therefore, in that context, if the United States of America really takes the step of recognizing a Palestinian state, which means that it has committed itself formally to a two-state solution, that would be certainly a very important step forward because the current Israeli government under Netanyahu has say, been saying no two-state is possible. You know, so that would be certainly an important uh, step uh, forward. But I think it is also, even when we are looking at that future, the most important thing currently is how to stop the conflict. Because the kind of human suffering that is taking place as a result of these military operations in Gaza, mainly affecting you know, innocent men, women and children, I think uh, the world's conscience should be aroused. Uh, how can you possibly, in today's world, tolerate this kind of, you know, in absolutely incredible suffering that is being visited on innocent uh, people? Uh, so I think it is a failure of, in a sense, the world's conscience that it has not been able to come together and say, this far, no fault. Uh, so my next question is also in the context of the war in Gaza, as uh, I'm sure you must also know that uh, an, uh, an international force uh, is is in the works to uh, prevent attacks uh, on merchant vessels in the Red Sea. Uh, do you believe that the deployment of such a force and uh, strikes uh, against uh, the Houthi rebels in Yemen, uh, do you think that could be a prelude to a larger uh, conflict? Well, that danger is always there, of course. But, uh, you know, uh, as you have seen, uh, even the Indian naval forces have been involved in protecting our shipping. Uh, not only our shipping, but <laughs> shipping belonging to other countries as well. Uh, because so much is at stake. You know, this is a main waterway for energy supplies, for world trade. And therefore, whatever may be the grievances that the Houthis have, whatever be their desire to support uh, Palestine, uh, we do certainly do not think that this is the way uh, to go about, you know, offering that uh, support. Uh, because uh, it is leading to uh, not only uh, losses, economic losses to a number of countries in the region, but uh, it will eventually not really help whatever cause the Houthis have, you know, or, or the countries in the re uh, region itself. Uh, so this is a difficult question, but I think the fact that India has proactively deployed its naval vessels and has actually protected its own shipping and that of many other countries. Uh, I think that's a very uh, good move on its part uh, because uh, after all, uh, this uh, neighborhood uh, that uh, is important to India and we should be seen as being active there. Uh, so there is much else that I would love to discuss with you, but I'm, uh, I'm aware that you are short on time. So we'll now move to uh, uh, towards the uh, final uh, part of our uh, discussion, wherein I would want to talk to you about uh, your uh, time in the Foreign Service. In particular, uh, you played a key role in negotiating the civil nuclear deal. Uh, do you agree with the notion that uh, Prime Minister Manmohan Singh, uh, with how he masterfully maneuvered uh, political circles and he, uh, the UPA's own allies, to push the deal through Parliament. Uh, do you think he did not get his rightful due? Well, I have always felt that uh, Dr. Manmohan Singh has been a most underrated Prime Minister. Uh, I think the nation owes a great deal to him. 
and not just the nuclear deal. I think uh, Dr. Manmohan Singh in many ways, uh, you know, was one of the wisest uh, leaders that we have had. Uh, and whether it is in terms of putting India on the path of more accelerated economic growth, um, you know, ensuring that India's relationship with its neighbors, even a difficult neighbor like uh, Pakistan, uh, we at least made an effort to, to try and improve those relations. You know, the whole concept of neighborhood first. Uh, in all these respects, I think a uh, number of initiatives that he took uh, stood India very well. Uh, so I certainly, uh, of course, maybe I'm biased <laughs> because I essentially worked together with him. Uh, but I certainly do feel that uh, uh, he was one of the uh, more, wise, more wise leaders that we have had in a long time. So uh, you also served as Special Envoy and Chief Negotiator on climate change. So this, I understand, is also an issue that is very close to your heart. Uh, we have seen over the past uh, year, few years extreme weather events around the world. Uh, do you think uh, initiatives like the COP, while they may uh, be an opportunity for world leaders to come together and discuss the issue and set targets, do you think that... Uh, much more needs to be done to actually get the ball rolling on it? You know, the climate change issue is an issue which is not standing still. You know, the longer you delay action on climate change, the bigger it becomes. So I think that dynamic has to be kept in mind. People talk about how some very positive moves have been made. So if, if you take, for example, the recently concluded COP28, I think it was a very important uh, decision taken by COP28 that the fundamental answer to climate change is to bring about a transition as quickly as possible from fossil fuels to renewable sources of energy, to cleaner sources of energy. Only through this transition can we hope to deal with climate change. So that is a very important recognition at the international level that whether we like it or not, we can no longer continue uh, to depend upon carbon fuels. Now, oil, gas, coal, these have to be out of the energy system. So, the fact that that recognition has come about, I think is a very important step forward, a very significant step forward. The problem is that the speed at which that transition must take place. Yes, it is a very, very uh, uphill task. Uh, but there is no alternative. Uh, so my fear is that even though we have recognized that challenge, uh, we are not able to move with the speed and with the kind of you know, determination that is required in order to really deal with this problem. As I said, what we have to keep in mind is that these, the longer you take to deal with it, the bigger the problem becomes. So it's not a static problem. You know, uh, in that respect, I think India has done very well because it has some very, very, you know, ambitious renewable energy uh, targets. Uh, it is one of the countries which is probably ahead in meeting the commitments that it has put forward as a part of the uh, COP process. But, you know, India alone cannot resolve this problem. This is truly a global problem. So many people say India has very large emissions. You know, our emissions, global emissions, are something like 7% of the total. Now, even if by some miracle, you were able to get rid of that 7%, would climate change stop? No. So, because it is a global issue, unless people come together, it cannot, cannot really deal with this issue. Uh, so, it's a complex issue, uh, but it's not that, uh, you know, solutions are not uh, there. Uh, it's a question of political will. Is the world ready to really get its act together and move quickly in terms of dealing with it? Uh, so, my, I just have, uh, before we wrap up, I just have two, three quick questions. Uh, your favorite musician? Sorry? Your favorite musician. <laughs> favorite musician? Uh, yes, there are several musicians who are my favorites. Uh, there is Ashwini uh, Bhide. Uh, there is, uh, you know, uh, somebody like... Uh, the great musician who passed away recently, Rashid uh, Khan. Uh, yeah, 
people like that how uh, and any ott series you've seen lately you might have liked uh, unfortunately i haven't <laughs> i haven't seen any very uh, recently i don't have much time to see otts but uh, yeah there are there are some some uh, good uh, otts uh, which i hope to be able to see i've heard about archies so maybe i will go and see that thank you so much sir for taking out the time to speak with us